All right, if there are no questions, we'll go ahead and then get started on the main topic for today. So I should have the video and audio all sorted out. Again, at any point, if you have, uh, if something's wrong with the video, let me know. Um, or if you have a question, don't be afraid just to pop up and um, uh, ask it because it's going to be difficult to uh, see everybody and also uh, see a hand raised or things like that. So again, I'm in front of a, I'm in front of a physical board. So if you have any questions, just pop up and ask me a question. Anything before we begin? Okay. So uh, we have uh, looked a little bit about that. We have looked at this topic a little bit in brief um, last time. But we're going to be uh, today. We're going to be diving in deep into gravity loading and the gravity force twisting system. So let's consider gravity loading. We're going to be looking at a few different loads, uh, snow load, uh, live load, dead load, that sort of thing. The gravity force twisting system effect uh, essentially looks at any load that acts in the vertical direction that is ultimately caused by gravity. So gravity loading is resisted by the gravity force resisting system. or just GFRS. So before we look at loads, let's look at the components of the gravity force resisting system. So um, now in terms of where all this stuff is laid out, where all the loads are laid out, or where the details of the gravity force resisting system in terms of definition and such are laid out, um, this is all laid out in ASCE 716 or whatever version they come out with in subsequent years. The key is ASC-7. ASC-7 is the minimum design loads for buildings and other structures. And that is the defining load document for structural engineers, at least for ordinary um, civilian type buildings, ordinary, just regular buildings. If you're talking about um, various other applications have their own sources of loads. For example, if you're doing like um, you know, railroads have their own code, the, are their own specification, um, highway codes have their, the highway standards have their own thing with AASHTO, there's stuff for, uh, like offshore platform, offshore oil platforms and things have their own sets of loadings, but for most of the buildings you're going to design, any building that's going to be, uh, occupied by the public, any building that you, you know, generally occupy in your day-to-day -day life, this is ASC 716, and that's where all of this is ultimately from. But let's talk about the gravity force resisting system in general. Let's look at the components therein. So the first component, so basically what I wanna do is I want to go through the components of the gravity force resisting system and trace how a load is delivered from its ultimate source to its ultimate destination. We learned last time, or we described last time that a structure is ultimately a, a device or a process or a system for gathering loads up either for, that are imposed on them and delivering them to some source of resistance, usually the soil, usually the foundation. Um, so we're gonna trace where load actually comes from and we're gonna be looking at, we're gonna trace how load flows through a structure. And in particular, we're going to be looking at uh, the gravity force resisting system right now. So the first type, so think about a building. Think about a building that you're, think about the building that you're in right now. Um, I'm in just an ordinary house right now and, um, I represent live load on the floor of the structure. And the same thing, um, and all the furniture around me, all that stuff also represents live load. And we'll be talking about that a bit in a, a bit more in a bit. But uh, the first thing that load gathers upon is the floor itself, the floor of the building, whatever that might be. And I'm just going to call that slab. So you have your slab, which is of course an element that is much flatter than it is thick or is much wider than it is thick, that sort of thing. And so these can be made a variety of things. Of course, we have concretes, specifically reinforced concretes. Um, you can have wood like sheet goods, think plywood, OSB, that sort of thing. Um, you can also have mass timber. That's becoming more prominent as we uh, try to move to a lower carbon uh, society and such. And then we also have things like composite decking. Yeah. 
What I mean by this is oftentimes you might do something like, there is this kind of thin metal decking that is used during construction, oftentimes with like uh, high rise office buildings and such, where you'll have a uh, steel decking like this. And this will then be laid out between beams and then you'll pour a concrete slab on top of the thin metal decking. And the advantage of this is that this decking also, is, it serves as the formwork, the lower formwork for your concrete. And that allows uh, more rapid construction, et cetera, et cetera. And also, and then when, um, if, you're, if you design it to do this, you can also add uh, thin tabs on the thin metal decking or small tabs, small shear tabs on the metal decking, which allow, once the concrete actually cures, it allows these to act in composite action. What that means is the steel and the concrete work together to form a kind of composite beam, although that's a bit beyond the scope of this class. Okay, so after we go to the slab, we go to our beams. In terms of vertical load, vertical load is first gathered by the slab, then delivered to the beams of the structure. And this could be a variety of things. We could have, uh, we could have some sort of wide flange shapes like steel, so for example, a poorly drawn W shape. Wow, that is really bad even for me. There we go. Looks a lot more like an I beam. <laughs> we can have concrete beams. Uh, and then in the world of timber, we can have a couple different things. You can have solid dimensional lumber. And then uh, also in more modern wood construction, like what residential construction, you can have things like composite eye joists where you might have a, say like a two by four or two by six forming the flanges of a floor joist. And then the middle, the, uh, the web here is made of OSB or plywood or something similar. That's very common as well. Okay. So after that, we need to trace, after the beams, we need to think about where the load goes after that. And again, we're talking only about vertical load here, only gravity load. We're not talking about lateral load, which is a whole other kettle of fish. We will introduce some topics of lateral load in this class, but you mainly cover that in structural analysis too. So let's look So let's look at the remaining components. I just wanted to go into a little more depth on the beams and the, and the slab. But after we look at the beams, the load then goes to, well, you're going to go to your girders if you have them. You don't always have them. Depends how your construction is actually laid out. Um, then, of course, load is going to go to your columns. After that, you'll have the foundation. And ultimately, the soil. Assuming we're talking about any kind of normal, sane structures. So, again, you can think of a structure as sort of a, uh, well, when I think of a structure as almost like a bucket brigade, like an old timey bucket brigade, how they, used to, <laughs> how they used to put out fires and fight fires before they had, you know, fire trucks and, and fire hydrants and things. If you wanted, if you were in Portland in 1850 or something, and there was a, a fire broke out, how would you handle that? Well, you would set up a bucket brigade. You would have a whole bunch of people, um, just put them in a line from a water source to a location of a fire, and you literally just pass buckets from one person to another. So I sort of, you can sort of, sort of think of a uh, gravity force adjusting system as a bucket brigade. It just load is passed from one element to the next to the next. So again, we start with, uh, it, you know, you start with your slab. It then hands off load to your beams. And it hands off load to your uh, girders, et cetera, et cetera, until you get down to the foundation. So um, when you're think again, when you're thinking about a structure, uh, I, I, I would really encourage you just to start thinking of structures this way, even um, maybe even just in the room that you're in. Think about how the weight that, that everything in that room is represented or represents. Uh, 
Think about, you know, if you're in a home, think about your desk, think about the table you're sitting at, think about um, a bed or whatever you might have in that room. Think in your mind about how that load, the weight of that ultimately finds its way to the soil. And uh, if you do that, you'll really start to appreciate a little bit how structures fundamentally work in real building systems. Okay, questions so far? I know this is fairly straightforward. We're just looking at some basic definitions, um, but any questions so far? Okay. Next, we're gonna start looking at dead load, a little bit deeper dive into dead load. And there is a very special type of dead load. And that, that comes if you uh, are building a like rooftop uh, pool deck and you're designing the structure for that. Uh, in that case, what you actually have, uh, the weight from, the not from the water, from the structure itself, what that is, is a dead pool load. I hope you like stupid puns. Anyway. So let's start uh, looking at, actually, I'll put a little start on the left side of this board. That's okay. We're gonna start a deeper dive into dead load. So dead load. So dead load, fundamentally what dead load is, it is the weight of all the permanently attached um, elements of the structure and appurtenances, et cetera, in a building. And this is the key, permanently. of a structure or a building. Or you can really just think, you can often think of this simply as the weight of the structure itself. So what is not included in dead load? Now let's look at what is, what isn't. Or maybe I'll just say dead. and live. We'll be looking at live load next. Um, dead load. So the first thing is going to be all of your structural elements. Beams, columns, um, slab, etc. That's the obvious stuff. That's all dead load. Uh, and then there are things that are obviously live load, like, you know, people, for example. People, furniture, Etc. Now, so that's, I think, fairly straightforward. That's fairly intuitive. However, you can then get into some interesting cases. So for example, in live load, you can also find, uh, how do I wanna say, uh, dividing, dividers. Think of, uh, think of like drywall in an office. in an office building, think of like a uh, drywall. In a, in a large office building, um, you'll have, typically they're designed, you know, with uh, sometimes composite decking, some other, some, sometimes some other mains, of, uh, some other flooring system, but you'll have your permanent structure with your various floor slabs, and I can just draw this. So imagine an office building. You build it, with a few beams and columns and you got your floor slab and et cetera, various floor plates with certain clear spans. 
But this is what the structure, this here is what the structure actually looks like. However, when some, when you, we, when an owner then goes and rents the space out to various uh, uh, tenants and such, they'll, the tenant will install various dividers. Like uh, um, sometimes you can think of, sometimes this could literally be cubicle walls, but often it can, but, but even like actual floor to ceiling dividers, these will get added to turn this large empty space into a usable space that they can actually, um, that's actually useful to them for whatever their purpose is. And these temporary dividers, these actually count as live load um, rather than dead load because they're not structural elements. They're not actually carrying the weight of the building above it. They are just there for uh, usability and practicality purposes um, for, the per for the person using the structure. And the, th and the reason we consider these live load is though, even though they're not moving around over the course of a day or even the course of a, over the course of a year, um, you do not want to count on their presence at all times because um, a building like this is often renovated many times over its lifespan. And so what, what, what one, uh, you know, in a certain rental space, one company might come in and put its walls in one location, then another company might move in, tear those walls down and put another one, put new ones in. Over the course of a building's lifespan, which is measured in many decades, um, even interior wall partitions move a lot. Now, of course, you can sometimes have columns and beams moving around in, over that time span. But if you're, do, if you're going to do any kind of major structural renovation, then you just have to perform new structural analysis. Okay. So there's that. And next, I want to work through a bit of an example in calculating dead load. So any questions before we look at an example? Okay. And this one's gonna be uh, actually a little bit of math for the first time, which I think we would get into sooner, this being structural analysis, but I uh, have to go over some basic theory first. All right, so let's say we have a, uh, we have a steel beam and with a certain, we have a floor system composed of a series of steel beams and a concrete floor slab. Oh, actually, before I, before I get into this, I do wanna give you three weights that will be very useful. Sorry, there was one other thing I wanted to talk about before this. In terms of dead load, there are really three weights you should be aware of if you're not already. And uh, I think these are three of the most important numbers a civil engineer could know, especially a structural engineer. If you, if you remember and memorize these three numbers, um, this will take you quite, you can be quite far in life just uh, <laughs> memorizing these three numbers. And these three weights are very important when calculating dead load, especially. So the, th the three things I would really encourage you to remember and memorize, not just remember, but memorize. Um, steel, its density, or actually it's specific, it's actually it's specific weight if you wanna be technical, is 490 pounds per cubic foot. For reinforced concrete, and this is reinforced concrete, not just, not just uh, pure concrete without any steel weighs a little bit less than this, uh, but reinforced concrete, if it's not lightweight, a good rule of thumb density or specific uh, weight in this case is, 150 pounds per cubic foot. So again, this is these are three numbers that are very good to memorize. And then water. There are so many things in structural engineering and civil engineering that we deal with the flow of water. So that's also good to know. And that's at 62.4 uh, pounds per cubic foot. And you could also, uh, I could also provide those in metric, but um, here in Freedom Land, we use, uh, <laughs> we use uh, English units. So example one. This is America. Um, okay, so we have a, uh, a floor system like this. Imagine we have a floor system that has that is supported by steel beams. 
Uh, I tell you that the floor slab is eight inches thick. This is made of reinforced concrete, normal weight. Normal weights, uh, reinforced concrete. And there are, there are beams separated by a distance of 10 feet. And I also tell you that the cross-sectional area of each of these beams is 10 square inches. And I want to, so again, we have steel beams of cross-sectional area, 10 square inches separated by distance, uh, distances of 10 feet. And I'm asking us to find, uh, find the, let's see, uh, the dead load per foot on each beam. And also I'm, I'm, I'm ignoring the edge, edge beams. I'm saying this continues on basically. So we're gonna be looking at this beam here. We're not gonna be worrying about like whether, what the slab does beyond this. Um, I'm, I'm worried about this middle beam here. Find the, the dead load uh, per foot uh, on the beam. So uh, again, again we have an eight-inch uh, an eight-inch reinforced normal weight concrete slab. We have steel beams uh, ten feet apart of area ten square inches each. And on this middle one, I want to find the dead load in um, pounds per foot um, on the beam. So first we need to think a little bit about uh, tributary area. And I will be covering tributary area with some more examples more in depth on Friday. But for now, think about, tribu uh, think about tributary area like this. If you have a, uh, if you have a beam, on a slab, series of beams under a slab. Some of the load is gonna to go to each of these beams. And typically how we assign it is that we just go to the uh, middle point. So these beams are separated by 10 feet, which means this middle beam is gonna get five feet of slab load on this side and five feet of slab load on this side, which means in combination, this is going to have a tributary width of 10 feet, adding those together. So let's go ahead and work through the calculation then. And I'm hoping this is still visible. I'm working on the lighting thing here still a bit. But uh, making progress, hopefully. At least the text is going in the right direction this time. Okay, so let's look at this example. Um, I'm gonna first calculate the slab weight. The weight of the slab um, so I can, I can just, I'll just call this W for now. Maybe, uh, maybe WS for weight of the slab. And first we need its thickness. It is an eight inch thick slab, simple enough. Then because I have my density in pounds per cubic foot, I need to convert this to uh, feet. So I'm gonna convert by uh, one foot divided by 12 inches. And that will give me the thickness in feet rather than inches. Um, next, I'm gonna um, multiply by the width of our tributary area for one beam, which again, we said was 10 feet. And finally, I'm going to multiply by my specific uh, weight, which is 150 pounds per cubic foot. And if we work through the units, okay, we see that inches and inches cancel out, um, this feet and and with this feet, that cancels out to just a pounds per foot. And if I multiply correctly, I get 1,000 pounds per foot, or simply one kip per foot. One kip per foot. So that's the weight of our slab. 
and then beam weight. Our beam weight, uh, W, let's see. So we don't know the exact dimensions of our beams. We don't know the width of the flanges or the thickness of the web or anything like that. However, for simplicity's sake, I did tell us that we have the cross-sectional area. And if you have cross-sectional area and you know the density, you can very easily get a weight per foot. So this is going to be 10 square inches. Then we need to convert to feet from inches. And we need to do that squared. We need to do that twice, basically. One foot divided by 12 inches. But remembering our dimensional analysis from elementary chem chemistry class, we uh, can get uh, feet to inches, or inches to feet in this case. And then finally, multiplying by the specific weight of steel, 490 pounds per cubic foot. And I get 34 pounds per foot if I manage to multiply that correctly. And then the overall depth weight, so maybe I can just call that um, WB for the weight of the beam or something. The, the labels are somewhat arbitrary. Then the overall dead distributed load, dead linear load, linear dead load, would be simply the sum of these two. Say WS plus WB, and that would then come to 1,034 pounds per foot. Assuming I did that math correctly, which you never know. Okay, uh, questions on this. Again, what I did was I started, I, I first needed to know my tributary width for my beam. And since these were evenly spaced, I just said it was halfway to the next beam. So I had a total tributary width on that beam of 10 feet. Then I, I wanted to get the, uh, basically the cross-sectional area of the concrete. Effectively, that's what this is. Um, from, let's say here to here is the cross-sectional area of the concrete slab in that uh, strip, in the tributary strip. And then I multiply by its specific weight and that transforms a cubic foot, essentially, uh, or a square footage into a kips per foot or a weight per foot. And I did that for both the steel beam and for the concrete slab and simply added them together to get the total uh, dead load. All right, any questions on this? All right, hopefully fairly straightforward, but again, if you have any questions, I'll help you doing office hours after class. Okay. So that's my quick introduction to dead load. Hopefully dead load is fairly straightforward. It's uh, really just an, ex it's largely when calculating it as largely an exercise and just applying basic material properties. Dead load in many ways is a lot simpler than live load because again, all you're doing is you're, you can, you can usually derive dead load from, you know, basic physical properties. You have materials of certain thicknesses with certain densities. And once you know that you just need to figure out the tributary widths and tributary areas, and then you can figure out the distributed loads, hopefully relatively easily, although it can get quite complex. Live load is actually a bit more interesting, I think though. Dead load, you can, again, you can figure just by, bit. you can determine just by basic material properties, but live load, that's a bit more interesting. All right, well, let's now look a little bit at live load. So again, live load represents the combined weight uh, or the distributed weight really, or sometimes point weight as well, of everything that a building that's really inside a building. 
or structure in general. So live loads. Uh, basically the weight of all the stuff in the building, for lack of a better word. That's one way to think of it. But how do you actually determine that? So this is ultimately based on um, a combination of um, the people, the furniture, any items being stored in the building, whatever you might have. And so what's interesting about this is that this is going to vary um, strongly with the type of building it is. Think about this for a second. Um, think about the difference between a, a live load in say a ordinary house, like I'm in now, versus say a library or a warehouse. Uh, a library, you're going to, in a big library, a big university library, for example, you're gonna have huge stacks of books and what lined up really close together, trying to cram as many books as possible into a small amount of space. And so, and those are actually quite heavy. If you actually add up all the massive, I don't know if, you, if, if, any, if any of you've ever had to move boxes worth of books um, when moving house or whatever, um, you can tell that, well, books are heavy. And so if you have a library, so think of the load that is generated by the stacks in a library, and that becomes quite significant, substantially higher than any kind of load you'd have in a ordinary, um, an ordinary bedroom or something like that. Also, you have um, some other things you need to consider are what load is actually being represented? Do we want the, uh, it's, it's easy enough to say, um, it's easy enough to say, okay, well, it's just the weight of everything in the building, but buildings aren't static. Think about something like a classroom. Now, this would work a lot easier if I was standing in a classroom with y'all, but um, I would normally say, hey, look at the classroom around you. Think about this classroom that you're in right now. Um, so imagine we're in a proper classroom. Um, so imagine you're there and then think about over the course of a 24 hour period or over a week, what kind of loading does that, build, does that room experience? You have um, a lot of the time it's gonna be empty except for you know, some furniture, some light tables and things like that. In a classroom, it's typically fairly empty, um, except when a class is going on, except when a lecture is going on. Um, and then the actual number of people will vary substantially depending on what course is being taught. But most of that time, that room is largely empty. Or think about, um, but think about uh, what, what is the maximum case? Think about a normal classroom. Like think about, um, think about what might be the worst case. Like when is that room loaded the, the heaviest, the most load it might have? And um, really, the, what comes to mind is some sort of like a uh, gathering or some sort of event, or at least to me, what comes to mind is some sort of gathering or some sort of event that uh, goes beyond the normal occupancy. So like, imagine there's a university, so say there's a classroom that normally seats 30 students, and imagine that there's some university club that is really popular, and um, so it's really popular, and they have tons of people who want to come to their meetings, and for whatever reason, they had to meet in this one room. And maybe instead of the normal 30 occupancy for a normal class, there's 50 people in there. And that 50 would represent the, really the design live load for that room. With live load, we're generally aiming for the worst case scenario. What, when you're de when determining live load, you perform a survey of a building and say, okay, well, um, looking at how this building is going to be used and not just one build, not just the whole building, but different areas. You're gonna be looking at the, the, the um, ordinary rooms like offices, it's apartments, you're going to be looking at apartments, individual apartments, then you'll have like different values for stairwells and values for hallways and different parts of the building will have different live load values. But basically for each part of the building that you're analyzing when determining live loads, well, determining the values that are uh, printed in codes, um, uh, they'll pref you look at a building and basically look at its various pieces and say, what is the worst case for each of these? Now, when actually practicing structural engineering in terms of like design, engi design engineering, you don't go and actually weigh, a build weigh the materials in a building. You instead look, up, uh, look it up in ASCE 7. And this is, let's see, that is chapter four, I believe. Yeah, um, so yeah, that is, you'll find that in ASCE 716. And again, these in here, you will find all values for live loads.
And uh, again, so you'll just look these up in a table. When, when you're doing, when you're designing most buildings, you'll simply look up a value in a table. You'll say, okay, if I'm designing a school, I will look up a value for schools. And then if I'm, if I'm looking at the hallway of a school, I will find the corresponding section for corridors. And it will just have a table value saying, oh, use X amount of pounds per square foot with also some point loads that you sometimes have to consider. Um, but how are those values actually determined? How, where did those numbers come from? Well, it's actually kind of interesting. You can read up on the history of some of this. You can find some of this in the footnotes of the ASC 7. But um, how these are actually determined are through studies where they've actually gone out. And it's actually, I, I love the imagery of it. Like they'll go and um, uh, they'll go and if you want to know the, the uh, live on an office building, they will actually go and uh, get, recruit some company somewhere that lets them that will let them do this. And they'll actually empty out the entire building literally take everything out of the office, like all the furniture, all the stored paper, all the desks and everything, take them all out of the office and then weigh them, literally just weigh every single piece of furniture in a building. As you can imagine, they don't do these studies that often. And uh, some discussion could be had over whether they were, they're still accurate. Like, I do wonder how accurate some of the values are, and especially in areas that uh, have changed quite a bit. Like I imagine it, you might be able to speculate that maybe a office of 40 years ago might have higher uh, live loads than one today because of you know less paper being in the office or something like that. Although that is a whole other kettle of fish. Okay. Now, so basic for the for live loads, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, generally in to get a value for a live load on um, either point loads or area loads, um, you're just going to be looking up values in ASC7. However, uh, after we developed these values, we found over time, engineers have found that there is a problem with the values in the table. And that is that they're really too conservative. So let's look at this and you'll see, let's see what I mean by this. I want to draw a basic floor plan. So let's go back to our example of the university classroom. So think about a university building. Maybe you have a couple classrooms. I know some doors. And then, so basically I'm drawing, a, I'm crudely drawing at best a building where you have a hallway and then some uh, various side rooms representing classrooms. Okay, if I can manage to draw a straight line, that would be helpful. There we go. So we have a hallway uh, separating six classrooms. Now, like I said, the live load for uh, uh, that we apply to a classroom is going to be based on the maximum expected design event, the maximum expected event that we would expect to see at any time during its uh, lifespan, during the lifespan of the building. So what that might mean, for example, again, is some sort of event that is, what comes to mind for me at least, is some sort of event that loads it well beyond its normal capacity. Like, again, let's say we have this room here that um, has 50 people in it. So let's say this room is loaded with 50 people because there's some big gathering. And then um, let's say this room here is, has a regular class going on and there's 30 people. Um, then let's say this one is just empty. There's gonna be a class there later. Maybe there's two people in this one. There's no class going on. Uh, I can write the word people correctly. <laughs> there's no class there right now, but there's a couple students in there uh, working on some homework um, in the empty classroom. And then maybe there's 20 in this one and there's, I don't know, small uh, lab session in there with 15 students. So the live load value in the code is going to be based on this one. Um, the live load value in the code is going to be based on the worst case scenario um, with that room filled to absolute bursting to its maximum capacity. 
However, look what's going on in the rest of the building. Um, it is very unlikely that, uh, so live loads again are based on the worst case scenario that might occur at a given location in the building. Uh, however, it is very unlikely that that load is going to be, that high lo maximum load is going to occur in all rooms and all areas of the building simultaneously. And so if you take that design value and then apply that across the entire uh, floor of the building, you end up getting live loads that are way too high, that are just completely unrealistic. And you end up with structures that if you design a structure to that, you're going to end up with a structure that is way stronger than it needs to be, which, I mean, in terms of safety, that's gonna be fine. Um, if you design a building three times as strong as it needs to be, uh, you're not going to kill anyone by doing that. However, you do then end up making that building much more expensive to build, much harder to construct. Uh, you reduce the utility of those resources to society. So, um, you know, the, thought, the resources that could have gone to make that building less overbuilt could then go to something else that could serve some other positive purpose. So um, while there is no harm usually in safety in making a building very ex extraordinarily robust, in real world, in, in terms of actual, a real world with finite resources, um, if you're overbuilding a building, you're not doing uh, your job as an engineer properly. Again, I think I've mentioned, I think I said in the previous class, uh, anyone can make a bridge that can stand up it takes an engineer to make one that will barely stand up. Okay, so we've learned that the, uh, again, by applying uniform live loads directly from the code without any adjustment, we can end up with live loads uh, way too high uh, for reasonable structures. And you could, now you might ask, well, why don't we just reduce, why don't we just uh, reduce the design consideration? Why don't we just say, okay, well, what if we just considered 30 uh, uh, students in all the rooms or whatever it might be? The problem with that is the code really wants to stick with the worst case scenario. Uh, it would be, they, instead of actually changing, instead of not considering the worst case scenario, we instead have provisions that we're allowed to reduce the live load we can apply um, in certain cases. And that's what live load reduction is. And that's what we're gonna be looking at next. Okay, and that was a lot. Any questions before we can look at live load reduction? Okay. So again, we have live load and it's based on worst case scenarios for given occupancies and structures, types of buildings, I should say, and areas within them, corridors, hallways, stairways, offices, classrooms, whatnot, library stacks. But if we apply those across the entire across the, uh, the entire floor slab all at once, we get results that are way too unrealistic. Okay, so let's talk about live load reduction. Live load reduction. Okay, so again, we've discussed why it's necessary, but now let's look at the actual process of it. Steps. Our first step is going to be to determine the tributary area or uh, determine tributary area or more specifically in this case, the area this live load is applied to. and apply to a single element. So we're looking, so you calculate this per, on a per beam basis um, or just applied to. Uh, then you determine a coefficient. Your KLL coefficient, which is your uh, influence area factor. And uh, this can be seen in uh, table 4.7-1 in ASCE 7. Okay. And um, actually, I might go ahead and pull this up on the screen. Let me just 
Give me a second. I will pull up the ASCE 7 and find. And if you want, you can go to uh, you can go to Moodle. The I have posted chapters three and four of the ASC seven. Okay, live load element factor KLL. And I'm just going to share my screen right here. Okay, you should be seeing this now. So this is table 4.7-1, the live load element factor KL. And this is based on the uh, type of element. So we have interior columns, exterior columns without cantilever slabs, edge columns with cantilever slabs, et cetera. And based on the type of element, you're going to have a different KL, KLL factor. So this, uh, this, uh, these factors take into account just the nature of loading um, and also the consequences of failure. So um, certain elements that are more critical, like columns, will will uh, be uh, are are have a greater consequence of failure. And so you'll have you can have different KLL factors uh, because of that. Now. Um, in terms of the definitions, uh, I always found this a bit interesting and a little bit confusing sometimes. Say you have a grid of columns. Oh, actually I better, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing so you can see the board. Okay, so say you have a grid of columns. Well, interior columns is simple enough. That's going to be your interior column. Fair enough. What about edge columns versus exterior columns? Well, an exterior column, notice it says exterior columns without cantilevered slabs. So in other words, the slab, if the slab ends right there, this would be an exterior column. However, if the slab actually extended beyond, so it was cantilevered a bit, this wouldn't be an interior column, but it would be an edge column. That's the fundamental difference between those. Edge columns will have a can of the slab continuing beyond them. Interior columns will have uh, will be in the interior, but then exterior columns uh, will have the slab ending right at them or before them. Okay, so just a bit of definitions. We get the KL, KLL factor. And then we multiply the two. We have the tributary area, um, and we refer to this one as AT, A sub T. And then we calculate the product of the two. Uh, gets KLL times AT. And if KLL times AT, is greater than 400 square feet, then uh, live load reduction applies. And remember, the whole idea of live load reduction is that uh, we're if we apply this uh, one these extreme values across an, a wide area, then we end up being way too conservative. However, if you're dealing with a small area, like if our area literally, if our building literally was just one classroom, um, so like a modular schoolhouse type building or something, if your building is just one room, then it's not, uh, you don't really have that scenario where parts of the building are loaded much more than other ones in extreme events, where you'd have one room being completely full and another being uh, empty um, in the extreme case of the extreme event. So um, we put a minimum square footage value saying, okay, this is, we got to draw the line somewhere and we'll say if it's greater than 400 square feet, then live load reduction will apply. Okay. So once we determine that, we can then apply uh, the equations of live load reduction. And that this, the equations actually aren't too bad.
And the main equation for lab load reduction is as follows. We're going to say that L, our live load, is equal to L naught times 0 0.25 plus uh, 15, and this is using English units, divided by the square root of KLLAT. Like so. Um, and what L naught is, is the initial tabular value, table value of live load. And L is the reduced live load. Is your reduced live load. And then there is also a minimum on this that L must be greater than or equal to 0 0.5 L naught. So regardless of what the math tells you, you have to consider at least 50% of the, of the overall uh, live load. Okay, at least 50% of the overall live load. And that's the basic, basic principle of live load reduction. So today we've looked at, uh, let's look, review a little bit. We've looked at uh, the gravity force resisting system in terms of definitions. We've explored the various elements within them. Uh, explored how load is gathered by the slab to beams, to girders, to columns, to foundation, and also the soil, which supports all of the gravity load. Uh, we've looked at dead load and defined what it is, uh, how it's calculated, gone through a simple example. And we've looked at then live load, how live loads are determined, and the necessity and methods of live load reduction. All right, any questions? <laughs>